unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Today I want to talk about Romans chapter 6, something very important there to touch. And of course I'm going to bury many doctrines and I'm going to kill suckered cows this evening. But bear with me as I kill certain things to build other things. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, Romans chapter 6 and verses 8, it says, let's begin from verses 8. The Bible says, if we be dead with Christ, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's the confidence that you and I know that I live with Jesus. They're not just talking about the life after. Eternal life is not the life after. Eternal life is the life now in the revelation of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's eternal life. For this is eternal life that you might know the one true God and his only Son Jesus. So eternal life is knowing God and the Son Jesus. That's eternal life. He says, if we be dead with Christ, the Bible says, then we shall also what? Live with him. And now he explains what it means to live with him. Right? That's why if you go back in that verse, there's a full colon there. Meaning that now they are giving the explanation of what it means to live with him. And if we indeed are dead with him, somebody say amen. Now the next verse says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead died no more, death has no more dominion over him. Death has no dominion over him because he died no more. Somebody shout hallelujah. So if death has no dominion over Christ, does it have dominion over you? Uh-uh. You are one with Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now the Bible says in the next verse, that for in that he died, he died unto sin once. Eh? Rewind a bit. Let's go back to the verse before. Knowing that Christ raised, being raised from the dead died no more. And death has no more dominion over him. Death has no dominion over him because he dies no more. He died once and that's it. And the next verse says, knowing for in that he died, the Bible says... In that he died, he died unto sin once. Jesus is not going to die unto sin again. You want to know why? Because he dealt with the sin issue. He can only repeat that death if he has not been done with it. The Bible says in that, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in, in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. He died unto sin once and he liveth unto God. And the next verse says, likewise, the same way Christ is, likewise, the, in the same manner, likewise, recon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed and to sin, but alive unto God through Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Let me kill the first suckered cow. Sin is not a problem of the new creature. Sin is a problem of the old and for the old. But sin is not a problem of or for the new creation. If you find many of our legal people and ask them, what do you think is the biggest problem in church? They would say, sin. 
And I have good news for you. Sin is not in any way a problem in the new creature. Oh, but we see a lot of sin in the church. Yes. I'll explain why we see a lot of it. Because men do not know. The problem in the church is not sin. The problem in the church is knowledge. The Bible says, for my people perish for a lack of, they are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They do not know God. They do not know Jesus. They don't understand what he has done. Again, I repeat, for the new creation, sin is not a problem. I didn't say it's not supposed to be a problem because that means I give a presupposition of its power over the believer. I say sin is not a problem for the new creature. Are you hearing me? Many years ago, I was summoned by a few religious leaders. Why do I call them religious? Because they were full of more religion than truth. That's why I call them religious. So they summoned me, about six of them. And when they summoned me, they sit me on a table round table. And then they, they read about 20, what, 23, 25 things. Extremities, they say, they call them of false grace preachers. Preachers, plural. But primarily, they put all these 25 on one man, Apostle Grace Lubega. And then these guys sat me down and then they started you know, interrogating me. They said, and, and, and this is funny. Every time people who have not understood the grace of God attack people who preach the grace. Do you know what they say? They don't say that we preach supporting sin. No. They say we teach people to sin. <laughs> How can I teach you to steal? You know what stealing is. Do you understand what I'm saying? How can they teach you to lie? You learned to lie before anybody even told you what it was. Who understands what I'm saying? It's in, your, it's in your original Adamic nature to know how to sin. Are you hearing me? Do you understand what I'm saying? Because this is a nature issue. So I told them, no, that's not true. I am a man against sin. Then they asked me, so how come when you're teaching, you don't talk about sin? I told him, that's a problem. You think that everybody against something has to talk about it to be against it. You understand? But you see, I don't need to talk about it to be against it. Because if I talk about what I'm against in this dispensation, I will, I will set it ablaze. I will stir it to, to life. I will... Ignite it. I am against sin. But I don't preach about sin. And some people think that because we don't preach about it, therefore we're not against it. But the only challenge with them is they don't know that there is a way to, to minister to men against it without talking about it. Because you don't need to talk about it to, for, men to be, for you to be against it. Who has understood what I'm saying? So what do they do? They talk about it. And the more they talk about it, the more they establish the law. And the more they establish the law, they kill. Are you following what I'm saying? So, they look at me straight in the face. I remember that as it was yesterday, but this took place about four years ago. And they told me, your days on this university are over. And the Bible says, if you don't find wisdom or knowledge in a man, walk away. D don't argue. Uh -uh. If you don't find wisdom in a man, walk away. You know what I did? I heard their words and I just walked away. 
2018, I'm still in universities. And none of those men is in universities preaching. I don't know whether they still think they are right. And peradventure, Satan defeated them with God. In fact, I remember a young girl who one time wrote me a text message and told me, as the leader of this fellowship, somewhere in one university, she, she said, I, by the authority given to me, I banish you off this campus. She ran mad. She ran mad. She ran mad. Because you see, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. She wasn't fighting me. She was fighting the word of God. Do you understand? You don't fight the word of God. You don't fight truth. You don't fight. And truth defends itself. That's the difference between showing off and showing forth. You understand? Showing off is you writing a list of your abilities. Showing forth is men testifying of your results. That you might show forth the praises of him. Who called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light. Tell your neighbor we show forth. Say again and say we show forth. Amen. Say amen. So I realize that problem. They think that when you say don't steal. Therefore you have given men the strength not to steal. When they say oh don't lie. They think oh now you have given the man the strength not to lie. Listen. By the law, the Bible says, no flesh shall be justified. By the law, by the law, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh justified in his sight. For by the law, the Bible says, by the law, who is the knowledge of sin. So how do you think that by giving men the law, men will know God? We are against sin. But we don't preach about sin. No. We preach about Christ. For Paul says, For when I was with you or in you or among you, I sought to know nothing and be acquainted of nothing. I don't know who stole, who did what, which pastor did what. Oh, He says, For I resolved to know nothing, to be acquainted with nothing, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing and to be conscious of nothing among you except Jesus Christ the Messiah and him crucified. Give men Christ. Let him handle the details of change. But give men Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now we are going in meat in a few minutes. We are going in, in the meat. So he says likewise, like you see the Christ Died for sin. He bore our sins. All our sins he bore on the cross. Ain't it? You understand? And when he bore our sins on the cross. He died indeed unto sin. And then he liveth unto God. And he says and likewise. Likewise. Record yourselves, yourself, also yourselves. Dead. To be dead indeed unto sin. But alive unto God. When you recall. When you count yourself to be so. You don't. You don't give strength and power to what you're dead to. Oh, give me the message of that. Romans 6, 11. You love it. The message version of that. He says, from now on. Tell your neighbor, from now on. He says, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language. That means nothing to you. And the Bible says, and God speaks your mother tongue. And you hang on every word. You are dead to sin and alive and do God. That is what Jesus did. So sin is not my problem. I don't want to waste time in what's not my problem. I cannot even waste time in what's not my problem. Oh, but people are struggling with it. I'll explain to you why they are struggling with it. They do not yet know what Christ has done. When you understand what Christ has done, sin literally falls off you. It literally loses its power over you. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
it loses its strength and ability over you. We're not supposed to tell people, oh, this don't do this. No, no, we're supposed to tell people what Jesus has done. When you tell men what Jesus has done, let God handle the details of how to change every man. The message warns us on that. He says, if there are any manners to keep, if there are any things to learn, he says, let God deal with people. Don't be the judge and jury. Don't, don't be the executioner. Don't, don't, don't enter it. No, oh, 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 no. If there's anything for people to learn, if there's anything to change people, if you think that this person has an issue and they need change in their lives, give them God. Let God deal with them. Praise God. Romans 14 says, do you have any business crossing people off the death list? Some of you have a way of, oh, that's not a man of God. I doubt that that sister is born again. Woo! How do you know? Do you know their heart? Come on, somebody. Stop crossing people off the death list. Or interfering with God's welcome. If there are corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can handle that without you. Oprah. Do you understand what I'm saying? God can handle that without you. God has not called us to change people. He has called us to give men Jesus and let Jesus handle people. Just give them Jesus. Even if you remind them what they did, they already know before you even tell them. But you telling them what they did and change the fact that they know what they are and who they are. Just give them Jesus. Listen, we are all in the flesh a work in progress. All of us, even the most holy man on the face of the earth, is a work in progress in the flesh. Do you understand what I'm saying? But we, through the spirit, kill the transactions of the body. Now, if you kill the spirit, where is the help of the body? Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you get this? So he says, sin speaks a dead language to you. The only way sin can give you a language that has meaning is if you have not yet known what Christ has done. <laughs> Do you understand? But it speaks a dead language. Your mother tongue is God's language. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's the one you hear and understand. That means some of you, when you get this, you get to a point where when sin starts to speak, you're like, huh? Sorry? What? I don't understand. What? Huh? What? Uh-uh. I don't understand you. Sorry. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say amen. We're going deeper here. Now, he says in um, verses 14, he says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Again, he has said it again. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. I want you to underline that word under. You're not under the law, but under grace. You're not under the law, but under grace. It shall not have dominion. The Amplified says, for sin shall not. He said, give me Amplified. He says, the Amplified version. He says, for sin shall not any longer exact dominion over you since now you're not under the law as slaves but under grace as subjects of God's favor and mercy. Every time God looks at you, you're a subject of his favor and mercy. You're a subject. He looks at you like, whoa, look at the person I'm planning to favor. So I tell people, learn to communicate those things upon your life. Because there's execution in the word spoken. In the hearing of the angelics. In the hearing of the Holy Ghost. In the hearing of Father God. Your words are powerful. You know that. You know that. You know that. You know how powerful your words are. If you get in a place where you fear. Or you're worried. Or you, you feel condemned. Go back to the word and speak it upon your life. Or hear someone speaking it. Go to the truth and listen to it. Or, or speak it to yourself. But hear. It's the only way. You understand what I'm saying? 
You remember when Gideon was going to attack, was it the Ammonites? And then God told Gideon, if you are scared, if you feel that you still fear, even when I've promised you victory, go with your friend, was it Pura? And he says, sneak into the camp and hear what they will say. You'll come back without fear. That means, oh, some of you, there are things that scare you, but when you hear what they say, they're already defeated. Some people, the moment they speak, they're already defeated. And in their hearing, as Pura draws near with Gideon, a man says, oh, I dreamt of bread hitting, da, 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 hitting the, the scalp. Oh, the guy knew, oh, this is the victory of Gideon. He says, thou shall hear what they say. And he says, and afterward thine hand shall be strengthened. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of you, you get to a point where you fear. And sometimes you need to hear what the other camp says. To be strengthened. Of course, that's for some people who need to. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a deep psalm there. Very deep singing there. I'll, I'll share it one day maybe. He says, it shall not have power over you. Now, the next verse says, ah, what religious people love most. <laughs> what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? And he said, God for peace. Now it tells the Christian, you know, at one point, it seems as though Paul is answering unbelievers. But in this instance, he's trying now to talk to believers. Who must know certain things? And tells him, know ye not. Next verse. He says, know ye not. Or don't you know. Next verse. But, eh, Jesus. Okay. Let, let me use mine. He says, do you not know? Yes. He says, what then are we to conclude? Shall we sin because we live not under the law, but under God's favor and mercy? He says, certainly not. He says, do ye not know, or know ye not, that to whom you yield, listen, yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, and whether of sin and to death, or of obedience and to righteousness. Now, many people abuse that scripture. You know what they mean to say? They mean to say, when they read that verse, verse 16, they mean to say that if you are, if you see sin in your flesh, therefore you're a slave of sin. Or if you see righteousness in your flesh, therefore you're a slave of righteousness. But there are people who have righteousness in their flesh, but their spirits are dead. You understand? Their spirits are dead. Perhaps Mahatma Gandhi was a very good man outside here. But that doesn't mean that Gandhi is going to go to heaven because he was living, he was righteous out, outwardly. And God is not saying that therefore live foolishly outwardly because you are under grace. If, if, you even, if we even debate that, then we are talking of a nature issue. We are not talking of a doctrine issue to be continued. But God is not talking about when he says, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to, to obey. I want you to underline the word to obey. His servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin and to death or of obedience and to righteousness. He spoke of yourself servants to whom you obey. Servants to obey. Underline the word obedience there. Obedience. He's talking about obedience. Whoever you obey, you are a slave to. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. And, and then verse 17 now brings so sobriety to the believer. He says, but, 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 thank God. Oh, God be thanked that you were, past tense, that means he's not talking. He's not talking about the, 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 the condition of things that are manifested in your flesh. No, he's talking about the testimony of his work in your spirit. He says, but God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, of sin, but, again he says, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Now, a man says, but you see you're saying, obeyed. So if you don't obey, what are you? 
But you see, when you read here, you realize when he defines your obedience to that form of doctrine, he's not talking about simply the, the decision of the actions you did because you had the word only. Let me explain what that obedience is. The Greek word there for obeyed is hupako. Right? Hupako. And it comes from two Greek words, hupo and ako. Right? Hupo means to be under. Ako as one whose ears listen and heed. That means you put yourselves under the doctrine to hear it. Did you hear that? So if I can translate it to the English, in the Greek, the Greek impl 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 implied, he says, but thank be to God that you were servants of sin, but when you went, put yourself under to hear in your heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, you were delivered. Who has understood what I just said? This has not the precedence of the action that obeys simply the word spoken to you, but it is, carries the precedence of the attention, the, the listening that you give yourself to the truth. And when you hear the truth, the truth makes you free. So it's not, don't steal and then you don't. No. It's the doctrine of Christ given a believer and the moment the believer hears, that word carries its an inherent power. To deliver the believer from sin. And that's why he says, For now there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ. In Christ Jesus. That's a mystery. For the law of the life giving spirit in Christ has set them free from the law of sin and death. It has. It's not going to. When you embrace grace, you are delivered from the judgment of sin, its power, and consequently, it starts to work in your body and flesh to obey the way of the spirit. But it begins in hearing the right form of doctrine. It doesn't begin in judging the individual. It begins in obeying the right form of doctrine. The right form first. I don't know if I don't understand this. We have to teach the gospel right first. Then men will walk free. If we preach it the wrong way, it doesn't matter how much we force them to do the right thing. They will not do the right thing until we give them the true form of doctrine. When the form of doctrine comes and we give them Jesus, Jesus changes them. Psalms chapter 18 verses 44. Psalms chapter 18, verses 44. Psalms chapter 18, verses 44. He says, as soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. This is Jesus telling you. If they hear me, they will obey me. If you preach something that is not me, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how beautiful it looks. They will not obey me. Because you're not talking about me. You're talking about Moses. For Moses brings the law. But grace and truth come by Jesus. If you preach grace and truth, you're giving men Jesus. And he says, if they hear me, if they hear of me, they will obey me. Hearing precedes obedience. The only reason why the church is still struggling with the sin issue is because we have put different things on the altar and we call them Jesus. If we give men Christ, if they can hear him, you don't worry about them obeying him. The power is not in their ability to obey because you have applied wisdom to them. The power is in the word which is wisdom. God that they simply hearken unto. They listen. They hear. And when they hear it, it causes them. Who has understood what I just said? If you're struggling with sin, look for a grace sermon. Who has understood what I just said? Because grace and truth came by Jesus. Don't look for the law. 
If you're struggling with sin, don't put in a sermon that judges you. Look for a sermon that defines his love for you. And switch it on. His forgiveness and loving mercy. The Bible says, for there is forgiveness with thee that men will fear you. You see how men fear God? Reverence. That reverence they give God. You know how reverence comes to God? When men know of his love, when there is forgiveness, when there is mercy with him. That's very ironical because you see, that's not how we were taught. We were taught to fear God because he can turn into a lion any time and devour you from there. And then men messed up and after they messed up, they looked and he did nothing. Then they continued to mess up and then they looked and did nothing. And then they said, now this time I'm dead. Then they go and then God doesn't do anything to them. I'm like, but, but how come it's not? Maybe I still have some. So they continue into what? More sin. Why? Because you are putting boundaries on them to walk out of sin by preaching judgment and anger and vengeance to them. Love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8. He says, it never fails. When you give men love, love covers a multitude of sins, but it never fails to change the believer. That is the one thing many of our religious people have failed to understand. That the wrath of man worketh not righteousness. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. It doesn't begin from your anger in what the person has done. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, you back all you want. They're not going to change because you're backing at them. They're going to change because they've seen the love of God. He says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I'm not talking about the righteousness of man. I'm talking about the righteousness of God. Who knows what the righteousness of God is? The righteousness of God is the righteousness you have obtained because you believed in Christ. Romans 3. You understand? The righteousness of God. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So it, it, it's not about the law, but yet the law testifies of it. He says, even the righteousness of God, which is by what? By works? No. Which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe. Ooh, are you a believer? You're the righteousness of God in Christ. And he says, that kind of righteousness does not come when you bring wrath. That one. If you're talking of the righteousness of men, which is filthy rags, uh, that one there you have to quarrel men into walking right. But if you're talking of the righteousness, which is of God, which is of God, it does not come by your wrath. It comes by your love. Who has understood what I just said? For God, so even God could not change the world without love. How do you think you're going to change a man without love? Come on, ask yourself that question. The infinite sovereign God, omnipotent, could not change the heart of man without love. How do you think that you're going to begin from wrath and change man? How many Israelites did he kill? How many did he slay for touching unholy things, for, for, for worshipping molten images and gramage, uh, I mean, uh, gra graven images and, and, and funny pictures? How many has he killed? Did Israel change? No. Israel stayed rebellious to God because it doesn't matter how angry you are, you will not change the heart of a man by wrath. You will not. You can't. At least not the righteousness of God. It does not come by your wrath. It comes by the love of God, by the faith of Jesus Christ, and to all and upon all that believe. For there is no difference between the sacred reverend, the righteous apostle, and the holy bishop. And the, the last person, he says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All have sinned. All. But you, you do this half for you, you're worse. Woohoo! Welcome to the world. There is no such thing as worse. Uh uh. You're all in the same boat. Have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, and here is now the problem. I started to see believers who agree with that form of doctrine, agree 
with the grace of God, but have not submitted themselves to it. Romans 10. My desire, brethren, is that Israel may be saved. For I bear them a record that they have a zeal, but not according to the knowledge of God. For they, the Bible says, being ignorant of God's righteousness, they are going about to establish their own righteousness. They have not, the Bible says, again, submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Some people disagree with the doctrine, but some, they agree with it, but they don't submit themselves to it. How do I know that you don't submit yourself to it? When you see a shortfall in your life, you quickly go legal. You believe in the grace of God, you believe in what it has done, just Jesus has done, his blood has been shed for you, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, da, 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 da. But when a small mistake happens in your flesh, you judge yourself, and become so legal, you start waiting for a punishment. You understand what I'm saying? That's how I know that you've not submitted yourself to it. Yes, you agree with it. You even scream over it. You shout over it. But when an error comes in your flesh, you, you go under a place of judging yourself. And you know, every time you carry a guilty, a, a guilty stain... Some of you don't know that that's false humility. In fact, it's pride. Because you're still telling yourself that in your own flesh you could perform. Say, okay, God, give me one more chance. Mama. But you see, it comes through the hearing of the word. When you give men the... Let me, let me read for you a testimony. I was even just coming up and they gave me a testimony list. Of course, somebody was healed with a skin disease. Uh... Blood pressure and diabetes disappeared. Many things. But listen to this. There's a young man, I don't know whether I'll say his name, but he wrote both names. He said, he developed an addiction of pornography, masturbation from watching pornographic movies. He says, in January this year, a friend invited him to Fanero, and he, has, he became a regular since then. He said, in September, listen to this testimony, he realized that he was not interested in the habit anymore. He just realized. Listen to the next line. He says, the delivering power of the word of God worked in him and made him free. His initials are DT somewhere. If you want, you can stand up and people see you. But I choose not to mention your name. Did you see that power? That somebody just simply, somebody invited him to a meeting. And he started hearing the word. No, demonic spirit, generational curse. Go, fire, by force, by the moon, by the star. Fire, no. The man sat under that form of doctrine. Who poke out. Under as one listening. Listening as one who is submitted. To listen as a subordinate. That means grace is not supposed to be something you simply understand like it's in your... No, it's supposed to be something you, you sit down to understand as a student understands a teacher. Submit yourself to the righteousness of God. Hear him. You'll find yourself obeying him. Now, that's why he says that you stop being slaves of sin from the day you obeyed that form in your heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. When they received that form of doctrine, that what their forbidance means, they, they listened to it as subordinate and under and submitted to its reality. It's, it's, yes, thank you. To listen, to hearken. To hearken. And as they listened, the obedience came. A certain command was was instilled in their spirit. It, it was stirred in their bodies. And before they knew that, their bodies started to agree with what they were listening to. Yet what they were listening to was not talking about sin. It was talking about Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. You will know, shall know the truth and the truth shall make you 
Verses 18 says, and having been made free from sin, having been made free, he's not talking, telling you you're going to be. That's why I told you, sin is not your problem. Knowledge is. Now he says, having been made free, when God looks at you, that's why, don't go to God telling him, I'm struggling with masturbation. <laughs> Just refuse to go. God will be like, but, but I made you free from that sin. Why are we talking about it? You understand? God, I'm struggling with stealing. I've tried, but I no longer have the power. But you see, you're being then made free from sin. Ye became the servants, past tense, of righteousness. Don't, that's why you go to the throne of grace boldly. You say, God, I thank you. Because I'm not a thief. That's a man repenting. Metanoia. You're changing your mind. I don't steal. That's true repentance. But some of you go, <laughs> I'm a thief. I am, a, you are. You, you even possess it in your reins. I am a thief. You, you, as a man thinketh, you understand? So he is. I am a thief. Even when you study the Gospels, when you study the language of the Spirit in which the Word is written, God has never defined men by what they are. No. He defined what they are as a state and then he defined them separately from the state. He didn't say an adulterous woman was brought to Christ. Read your Bible. He says a woman caught in adultery. He says, this woman was taken in adultery. She wasn't an adulterous woman. There are no alcohol addicts. No, there's just a man taken into alcohol. But he's not a God. Who, who has understood what I just said? He called him a man born with blindness. He didn't call him a blind man. That is why we open blind eyes. Are you hearing me? Do you know how we open blind eyes? Because we don't go to them as blind men. No. We go to them knowing that God is perfect. They are perfect. They are not supposed to be blind. So we appropriate the mind of the spirit. The wisdom of God. So fear, sunesis and phronesis. It comes in your faculty. Exposes this thing. And then you open the blind eye. That's why the Bible says, And then he, 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 he. Trust the blind man. No, he, he, the Bible says he, he rebuked the blind spirit. That's the language. He rebuked the blind spirit of the blind man and the man saw. So she's not a thief. No, she's a woman taken in what? Thikari, thifari. I'm sorry, my mother tongue is God, not English. My mother tongue is God. Not English. The mother tongue is God. Who has understood what I just said? Oh my God. That woman is a prostitute. If she's a... Listen. She's a woman struggling with prostitution. She's not a prostitute. That language God doesn't use. Stop using it. Tell your neighbor, stop using it. So I want to finish. So then I realized this one thing. That many of us have not submitted. That's why he uses the word under. Slaves of. So you go back to, to the 17th verse. You remember when he was talking about that. He says for for. for you were servants. You were slaves of sin. But that you have now listened and hearkened to this doctrine. What happens? You are free. You've been made free. You understand? That means the more we give men grace, the more we give men grace. Who has understood what I mean by that? The more we teach about the grace of God and what he has done the more men will see that reality. The more they listen and hearken themselves, the more they submit themselves to that doctrine, the more they walk in the freedom of Christ and consequently, their bodies agree to what they believe. 
Metanoia, repentance. That's why he says there is sorrow that leadeth not to repentance. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. You understand? Let me explain what it means there. You do something that does not befit the Christianity, the faith. That sorrow comes and you're like, I'm, this is not me. You understand what I'm saying? It leads to repentance. It leads to change of mind. You understand? That means you find yourself saying, I am not a thief. That's a man who has repented. But let me tell you what some people think repenting is. Father, I am a thief. You see, some say, oh, if we acknowledge our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. Listen, the acknowledgement there is not the owning, no, but the, 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 the knowledge that you know the difference between what's bad and good. That's all he means. He doesn't mean own it. Stop going to God telling him you a thief. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Go to him and say, I am your righteousness in Christ. If you've been struggling with stealing, say, I don't steal in the name of Jesus. That's somebody who has submitted themselves under that form of doctrine. Before you know that, it's your body starts to agree with the word that you have believed. Right believing leads to right living. The message Bible writes it somewhere. Right believing leads to right living. When you believe right, it's somewhere in the message. You live right. When you believe wrong, you live wrong. Many Christians think they can live right by believing wrong. That's deception. It's temporal. It's a temporary thing. It will flip you back and take you to where you belong. That is why we are struggling with people in church to convince some that what you think actually has power over you, it does not have power over you. I don't believe in addictions for a new creation. I don't believe in I believe in them for people who are not born again. But I don't believe in addictions to a new creature. I believe it's a lack of knowledge. You can't be addicted. Well, I'm addicted to what? Well, I'm addicted to alcohol. I'm addicted. How can you be addicted when sin has no power over you? Just say I'm under the law. I will understand when you say, I'm, I'm under the law. I'll just pray for you. <laughs> he says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Dominion there is the same word as addiction. Sin does not make you an addict. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. That means anybody under the law. Praise God. As you are working in progress with God, have this mind. That is why later Paul speaks a very deep word, very deep. He says in, 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 verses, in verses 19, he says, I'm speaking in familiar human terms because of your natural limitations. That means if we are talking to spiritual people, I would articulate this differently. But I have to speak to you with a familiar human term because of your natural limitations. Let me explain it to you in the way you'll understand it in, in, in your flesh, in, in the human mind. But if we are talking God language, if we're talking God language, there are things some of you were with me a couple of years ago. They brought a, they got a, a, a crazy mad girl. They took her to one of the biggest mental hospitals, Butabika. She spent days there. Somebody came and called me and apostle him and told us, this girl is mad. You remember that time? Some of you saw her. I told them, bring her to church. Bring all the madness there. They brought, mind me, God. She was beating people. She was doing things. Beating people. She, she broke everything. She was fighting everybody. She was abusive. She was rough. I just told him, you know what? Every time I stand on the pulpit, just make sure she sits in the word. She's sobered on her own. When no hospital drug could cool her, 
She was listening to the word. And before, she, ooh, Rabina, before we know that Robina's brain started coming to normalcy with nothing, no treatment, nothing, just uh, as I'm preaching, some things are happening in your life. Your finances are getting fixed. Your marriage is getting fixed. Your body is getting fixed. Your health is getting fixed. He says these words are medicine to their bones. They are life to them that find them and medicine to their bones. You don't, you don't need, some people have a wrong definition of the deliverance of God. Listen, he can deliver you anyway. The primary deliverer is the word of God. It's the word of God. You know, soon I pray to God to have not the time, but the grace to articulate the realities of the kingdom many of us think we are in. Or at least are in, but don't think we understand, but we don't. In, in Acts, I think it was chapter 1, verses 3. The Bible speaks of when Jesus was raised from the dead, okay? He was raised from the dead. The Bible says he, he showed himself alive. He showed himself alive after his passion. That's deep. He showed himself alive after his passion. He says, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now I want you to understand that. He says, listen, that's so deep. He says he, 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 he showed himself alive. By many infallible proofs. This was deeper than touch my fingers to feel that I'm alive. No. He was not talking about the fact that he was alive in the flesh. And resurrected. No, he's not talking about that. He was talking about his life in the kingdom. He was talking about the reality of what it means to be a child of God in the kingdom of God, in the realm of God. The liberties we have in God are so big that almost we now labor for men to believe the reality of that freedom. Not simply to embrace it, but to simply believe. Because some, it's not even the embracing part. They will embrace if they truly believe. But some are struggling to believe. No wonder Isaiah said, who shall believe our report? To whom is the hand of the Lord revealed? Who has this revelation? Because he knew we are going to struggle for men to believe this. So don't blame them when they don't believe that God wins men over by love and not wrath. I don't blame them when they they don't believe that you simply listen to the right thing and it works in you. No. For them, they think, no. You listen, but you also have a part to do. You have to do, to do, to do. You remember when I was thinking about obedience? The word to do there? It's the hearkening to allow the word of God. The Bible says it works by its own inherent power. You remember that scripture? He speaks, he was thinking he was talking to the church in Colossians. He speaks of that word which has come to you. He says it has come to you. Indeed that word. It's in the whole world. That gospel. Listen. That one. The one I'm talking about. The Bible says it's bearing fruit. If you're a pastor and your ministry is struggling. Inquire. What gospel are you preaching? This one is bearing fruit. No. Not your definition of fruit. No. God's definition of fruit. Some of you say, oh, we have fruit. But when we weigh you, you actually don't have proof. You don't have fruit. You, you have things that are like fruit. You're, that's why one day I want to talk about the mystery of the gospel. Why Jude calls them clouds that hold not water. Cisterns. Those cisterns that hold not water and clouds that hold not rain. They look like they're going to rain. You even prepare for it. You put the drums out. You want to harvest water and it does not rain. They, they promise what they'll never fulfill. They're ever talking of big stuff, but they'll never do anything. It's 20 years, you're still telling us, God is going to do this. God is going to do that. 30 years, God is going to do this. 40 years, God is going to, you die. And you're still saying, God is, and, and there's, there's nothing. You, you don't hold water. You're a system that holds not water. The Bible says, lose not. You feel. 
You understand what I'm saying? You're not supposed to be a leaking vessel. One time I was teaching about leaking vessels. Some people leak. They are filled, but they are leaking. They never, they never maintain a certain standard in the life of the spirit. They're like this, financially, relationship-wise, ministry. Everything is like that. Because they've not understood this kingdom thing. You will know. That's why people don't invest in teaching. Because the devil has deluded many from the understanding of what it means to know God. Invest in knowledge. It's the only eternal gift you have by God. To know him. This is eternal life. That you may know him. The one true God and his only son Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, Jesus is talking about, he's telling them, you see, there are many infallible proofs, many infallible proofs that he was alive. He was speaking to them about the realities of what it means to be free. Like I said, some will labor. Let's go back to Colossians. He says, this gospel, this particular gospel, it is bearing fruit and still is growing. By its own, I love that word, inherent power. When you embrace the truth, you don't struggle to grow. It grows. It bears fruits. That's why for us here in, in Fenero, we don't struggle with miracles. We, we don't struggle to do miracles. I don't need 20 minutes of fire, 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 power move. No. I don't need to, to do the power. No. Even if I swing my finger in the right direction. The power of God moves. Because it's the gospel. He says, even as it has done among you, ever since the day you first heard, again you see, first what? Heard and came to know and understand the grace of God in truth. You came to know the grace or undeserved favor of God in reality. Deeply and clearly, thoroughly becoming accurately and intimately acquainted with it. When you become accurate and intimately acquainted with the grace of God, the word of God starts to work in you by its own inherent power. You don't struggle to walk out of something. No, that thing walks out of you. And the word of God drives it out. You start having what they call effortless change. You realize you didn't struggle with what you thought you were supposed to. Some of you have been struggling with things for years. Tonight, by the entrance of the word of God, you're going to be shocked. Like my friend said, he said, he just realized. Effortless. He didn't go to the prayer mountains. No, he just realized that it was out of his life. And it shall be so. You realize one day that what your body has been struggling with is not struggling anymore. You'll wake up one day and realize the pain that was in your body is gone. You'll wake up one day and realize that the poverty you're struggling with is no more. You'll realize that the thoughts that were fighting you are nowhere. You, you will just wake up and realize I prophesy upon your life in the mighty name of Jesus that may effortless change the desired but effortless. You will not struggle. Tell your neighbor, I will not struggle. You will not struggle. You will not struggle. If you're struggling, then you're under the wrong doctrine. If you're struggling to get it out, then, then you've not submitted yourself. You're simply agreeing to what you've not submitted yourself to. Submit yourself to his grace. He means you allow him to work through you and in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Tell your neighbor, sin is not my problem. It's not my problem. The power of God is here. The power of God is here. Today, I saw a vision. It was about three for 2 p.m. Somebody, you woke up in the morning. Your eyes, today this morning, your eyes could not read. You were trying to read, but your eyes 
something affected your eyesight this morning you could not read literally you could not read come quickly come quickly come quickly this morning you woke up and you tried to read your eyes could not read the, the letters became triple like double they, they became so blur you could literally not read I saw that at 2pm come quickly the power of God is here to save you quickly quickly put up your hands oh there's more than one put up your hands put up your hands put up your hands I want to do two things and then close the service put up your hands put up your hands quickly 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 the power of God is coming just get in the line I need ushers behind them all right put up your hands right now in the name of Jesus power of the house God delivers you. The power of God comes upon you. He delivers your sight. You spirit of blindness, I command you to lose this woman right now. Lose her. Lose her. Lose her eyes. Lose her eyes. Lose her eyes. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lose her. Thank you, Lord. Somebody give the Lord a marvelous praise. It's done. Now, I want you to put up your hands. I need to release something here. Let me tell you. This I also heard as clear as you can hear my voice. And don't worry, the Holy Ghost will confirm this. I love every time the Spirit releases the anointing that brings things quicker. And every time I, I hear it, I want to do it because I know that somebody power the God redeems your time. You're going to do in days what people do in years. You're going to do in hours what people do in weeks. You're going to do in minutes what people do in centuries in the mighty name of Jesus come on receive it, receive it, receive it receive it, receive it, receive it receive it, receive it the anointing of the Holy Ghost is here power of the Holy Ghost come on give the Lord a man of praise it's done the message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.